In this video, I'm going to do two things. The first of which is show you the basics of how to use CircuitLab, uh, which is an online uh, software that has a free trial. And then the second is to show you how to use some of that information uh, to create plots in Excel, and then also how to do some of the equations in Excel and make some of the plots on your own to compare against. So to start off, circuitlab.com, and we want to launch CircuitLab to get into the actual uh, circuit. If you use CircuitLab a lot, then it'll start giving you this register to continue screen because they do want you to pay for the service, but there is a pretty easy get around. And what we can do is we can create a new incognito window and then go back to CircuitLab and they'll forget that we were there. So we can launch CircuitLab and they give us a starting circuit to work with. Now, the circuit that we want to start off looking at is just the resistor and a capacitor. So we want to delete these two circuit elements to start off. And then we just need to click and drag different pieces of our circuit to make the circuit look like it's supposed to. Now we have our circuit that has our input voltage, resistor, and capacitor. We also need to consider the inlet and outlet probes. So if this is our input source, this is the output from the waveform generator. Remember that the next thing we did once we had that was to go and hook up a probe directly to that waveform generator. Now, what it's not showing you is that we have two pieces to this probe, right? Well, the other side is always assumed to be ground. So we're getting exactly V in here. And then on this other side, we're interested in the voltage over this capacitor. And so we have our output probe uh, hooked up on one side of the capacitor and the other side again is going to be ground. So this is all we need to do to make our simple RC circuit. We do need to change these values and I can go and show you that. So let's put a one kilo ohm resistor here instead of the uh, 10 ohm resistor. And then we can change this value as well as needed. Now, the next step is to go down to this simulate tool. So if we click simulate, it's gonna default to a time domain simulation. So what that looks like is we have um, our input and our output, and we can see how they change over time. Now this is great, but the issue with it is that it's only for a single frequency. So we can see the frequency here, right? This is our one kilohertz frequency. But really what we want is we want to see how this changes over a wide variety of frequencies. So to do that, we click the frequency domain button. Now you need to give it an input and our input, the only one we really have available is V1. And what we're doing is we are modifying our frequency between these start and end points. So starting at one Hertz going up to, this is a hundred megahertz. And this points per decade basically says for every factor of 10, how many uh, additional data points do we want to output? So instead of five, I can just put 100 there and it's not gonna hurt anything. With that, all we need to do now is create an output. It says that we just need to click on a wire or element. So what we want to click on is our output here and it'll automatically populate it with two pieces. The first is, this is the decibel magnitude of our output voltage. So it calculates the magnitude and then it uses that magnitude to calculate decibels. It also gives us the phase in degrees of that output. So if we run this, then it'll give us on top our magnitude in decibels and our phase in degrees. Now this is useful. It shows us really well what's going on. But whenever you're making your calculations, you're not going to automatically have things in decibels. You're going to have the actual amplitude. So we can modify this by clicking this edit button. And all we need to do to modify it to give us the actual magnitude instead of the decibels is just by deleting that dB term. 
So our top is now, because it switches it up on us, is the phase angle. The bottom is our amplitude. Instead of getting the decibel output, now we'll get the amplitude output. And we can see that we start at one and we go down to zero at high frequencies. So that's the basics. Uh, other things that you'll need to do, right? We need to be able to modify our circuit here. And so the way that we modify it is we go back to this build and we can just drag and drop different elements. So we'll need to right click this, we can rotate it and it lets us just drop it right in. Let's change one more thing because we don't want the output there. We want the output over both of these, right? To make it match our other problem. So now we can run this and we see that we start off at a relatively high amplitude output. It drops down and then it starts to rise back up before it hits the cutoff of that 100 megahertz. In order to get this into Excel, all we need to do is export this plot. So if we export that plot, we can open that up and it will give us a circuit simulation which looks something like this. And it'll have our frequency, it'll have our phase in degrees, and then finally it'll have our magnitude for all of these frequencies. And then there we can make our own plot and get it the way we'd like it. Now, with that said, uh, let's be done with Circuit Lab for now. And Let's go ahead and open up uh, Excel. So in Excel, what we are trying to do is we are trying to create the same plot that Circuit Lab just created, but using that, creating it through calculations rather than creating it through the simulations. Our calculation here, we need to give it some resistance and some capacitance. And so I'm just going to create a resistance and a capacitance to start off. This is something that we can reference in our equations later, uh, and we can actually point to these values. The R and the C here, they don't do anything for us in terms of um, creating the equations. What they do is just remind us what these mean. We need to vary our frequency, and we can do this in a number of different ways, uh, but I'm going to start off at 100 and then go 200, 500, 1000, and so on and so forth. And so just so we get a good uh, variety of values here and have a good range to plot over. Once we have that, uh, we need to convert that into omega, right? Because this is our frequency, which is in hertz. It gives us things in one per second. This omega is in radians per second. So in order to change, all we need to do is just take that value. And I got that by pressing equals and then just moving to the left so I could grab it. Then I multiply by two times pi. Now, in order to use this pi, Excel is very finicky. We need to put an open and close parentheses. Uh, Excel sees this as a function. And so it needs those open close parentheses to recognize it but there's no actual arguments in that function. There's nothing to put inside. So that's all we need to do, and it'll give us our omega. With equations in Excel, we can click this right bottom corner and drag this down. And if we do that, then it will go ahead and copy the equation, but instead of copying it, it perfectly, it'll actually move any cells that we select for us. Now that'll be important later, and there's a way to get around that, which we'll need to do to, to use this R and C value. So what we're going to do, we're going to calculate the impedance of our two components, use those to calculate a total impedance, and then use that to figure out what the magnitude and phase angle of our output will be. So ZR, we know that that's just going to be equal to this R. So we can grab that. And then if we try to move this down, it's going to get very confused, right? Because it starts here, then it gets this next piece. What we want to do instead is put dollar signs in front of both of those values and then copy down. 
And what that does for us is it just keeps that value from changing. So the B1 that we started with remains B1 all the way down. Likewise, for ZC, our value here is going to be 1 divided by, and then we need our omega multiplied by C. So 1 over omega C. Now, we actually want our omega to move, so we're going to leave that one alone. But our B2, we're going to put dollar signs on. So whenever we move this down and look at this last one, we're using the bottom omega, but we're still using that original C value. So what we can see is that we start at a relatively high ZC, and as we increase our frequency, our ZC goes to zero, or close to it. So now what we're going to do is calculate the total. So our total is not just adding these two pieces, because remember, our R is real, where our ZC is going to be imaginary. So the way that we do this is that we actually take the square root of the sum of the squares. And once again, we can just drag that down and see how that changes. Now the last piece here is to figure out the magnitude of the output. So our V out over V in, we know that that is just going to be the ZC divided by Z tote. And we're just interested in magnitude here, so we don't have to worry about anything else. And then our final piece, we want to figure out the phase angle. So the phase angle, we need to look at the angles of ZC and Z tote. So the angle of ZC, we know that capacitors create impedance in the negative J direction. So this will be negative 90 negative 90 degrees. Then what we need to do is we need to calculate the impedance of the total. So we need to subtract this value because uh, the total is in the denominator whenever we're calculating our V out over V in. And we're going to use the ATAN2 command. Now ATAN2 takes two values, and, it, and Excel actually shows you there. It takes an X value and then a Y value. Our X value, that just means what is in the real direction. Our Y value is in the imaginary direction. Now, we took this as a positive, so in reality, this should be a negative D5. Finally, this A102 returns things in radians, so we need to convert that to degrees. So we need to take this, say that this is 180 divided by pi multiplied by a tan 2, because this is our conversion from radians to degrees. And so with that, we should get a value in degrees. And this starts off close to zero. And then as we continue on, it gets close to negative 90. So this is how we put those equations in. Uh, these are the equations that we need to use. What we want to do now is go ahead and generate some plots. So the way that we make plots is we use, under the Insert tab, we're going to use a scatter plot. So this is the scatter plot that we want to use. Now this has everything in it. That's not what we want. So we're going to go ahead and grab the specific columns that we want. And I highlighted both of those by using the Control key. And then if we plug it in, it'll actually give us only the magnitude in this case. So we have frequency along the bottom, and we have magnitude in our y-axis. Now, this is not particularly useful because it's really hard to see where all the action is. So what we can do is we can actually modify our axes not to be linear, like is the default, but to be logarithmic. So I'm going to modify our axis here along the bottom to be logarithmic. If I double click on that, it'll bring up the format access menu. And I want to go to axis options, which is a little graph bar thing. And then again, click axis options. And then I want to change that. There's a little tick here that says logarithmic scale. And so if I do that, then 
it'll be much cleaner and you'll be able to see what's going on much clearer. Now we're not getting the top of the curve here, right? Because we expect this to actually start off at one and it's not. So what that means is that I didn't start at a low enough frequency. What I can do to fix that is actually just by changing our resistance value rather than by trying to go back and change the frequency uh, or the capacitance value. So I think if I go one E negative nine, which would be a nanofarad, then we get things very high there. Let's try one E negative seven. And now things are starting to look a little bit better. So just playing around with those numbers until I get a plot that looks good. Now you're going to be confined as to what you have on your R and C values. So you're going to have to go in and actually add more frequencies, depending on if you need that to be shifted higher or lower. Now we're seeing a lot of empty space here. So let's go in and fix that. So if I go back to, and I just single clicked it this time, if I go back to my axis options, then I can actually change my minimum value. Having a frequency of one is not particularly useful. So I'm gonna switch that to 100, and doing that, we're getting a much better look at what's actually going on with our curve. So this is good for the x-axis. Um, for the y-axis, we can make a change. Um, we can go ahead and click over there, and we can switch that to be logarithmic as well. So if we do that, we start at one and we can see very much like we saw for the decibel plot that this starts tapering off uh, as a straight line after a while, whenever we're doing this logarithmically. So you can also see this if you create a decibel column. And we know that decibels are just equal to uh, 20 times the log base 10 of our amplitude. And so if we carry that down, then these decibel values should match pretty closely to what you had from circuit lab. Now, there's one more thing that's critically important in creating a plot. Right now, this plot is useless because we're not telling anything about what these axes actually mean. So one of the most critical pieces of this is to put in axis titles. And the way we do that is by going over to add chart element, axis titles, and then we can put in both the X and the Y axis titles. So our Y axis for this point is magnitude, right? And that's what's plotted for our y-axis, and our x-axis is just frequency. And I'm going to mention that that is measured in hertz. I don't have a unit for magnitude because it's v out over v in. It's just a ratio. It's, there's actually no units associated with this. So that's all we need to do for our plots. I'm going to make one more change, uh, just to be perfectly clear, because I might want to print this. And sometimes it's a little hard to print um, a plot just like this. Uh, so the way I can do that is I can move the chart to a new sheet. And I'm gonna call this uh, magnitude for RC circuits. So now it prints it on a completely clean sheet. What we will need to do now is change our text size. Because if we just printed it off like so, all these numbers would not be legible. So what we can do is we can go to these values. We can right click and click font. Right now it's size nine. I'm gonna bump that up to size 16 because that will be a lot easier to read. And I'm gonna do that for both of these. For our axis titles, I'm gonna make those even larger. So let's go ahead and make those size 20. And our overall title, I'm gonna make this size 24. The reason we're doing this is because it is very difficult if we scale this down later to go ahead and read it. 
So it's really important to increase those text sizes. Now, one last thing, I don't like the axis being up here at the top. So we can actually change that as well. The place we go to change where these values show up is in the labels section down here. Right now it says next to axis, but we want this to be low. So now, even though our axis, which starts at one, is up at top, our actual values are down at the bottom so that this plot is a lot easier to read. So that is everything you need to know both about how to simulate your circuit in CircuitLab and also how to calculate the values that you will have just using Excel. So I hope this was useful and good luck.